Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this wonderful, wonderful initiative and, and lecture series uh, on, on the Anthropocene. And I'm also thrilled to talk to 350 people. I can't remember the last time I talked to 350 people. It's just amazing. So, so uh, welcome all of you 350 people out there. I'm, I'm very happy that you're all here and I, I hope you will be, uh, will, will, be, will be there all the time, basically. Um, I should say a couple of warnings, I guess. Um, uh, when, when someone tells a scholar that he doesn't have a half an hour but 45 minutes, uh, enthusiasm is huge. So it might have taken the upper hand, and it might have been uh, it might, the whole thing might have been might have become a bit long. But we'll see. I think it will work out. Then uh, the second thing is that this is written. This is something written especially for this occasion. So I'm very uh, keen on getting comments and questions from all of you out there. Um, and yeah, then finally, I'm just really happy to be here and have you. And then I'll start sharing. I think. Um, Let's see. No. Okay. For something to be real, it needs to have a time and a place. Uh, at least in the discipline of history, the modern discipline of history, as it has come into being since the late 18th century. Even before that, early modern scholars would refer to chronology, the science of time, and geography, the science of space, as the two eyes of history. However, the question that guides today's lecture, when is the Anthropocene, is not a historical question in any modern disciplinary sense. In a way, the question is both older and more recent than the discipline of history, evoking a natural history that was once a knowledge project in its own right, but then collapsed into disciplines like biology, geology, and cosmology, today even earth system science. All these disciplines, however, produce histories and the Anthropocene has a place in all of them. Nevertheless, the same rule applies, I think. For it to be real, for it to be accepted as real and acted upon as real, the Anthropocene needs a time and a place, a set of chronological and geographical coordinates, markers, if you want. The place, like that of any other geological periodization, is Earth, our planet, as simple and indeed as complicated as that. Recently, the historian Deepa Chakrabarty, who in his later work has done a lot to help history adapt to the new situation and a new task brought upon the discipline by the Anthropocene, has referred to the planet as, and I quote, an emergent humanist category. As you know, there's nothing simple and straightforward about the planet as a site of human-induced climate change. Most importantly, we should not let ourselves be duped into believing that the Anthropocene is the same everywhere. That it has the same effects that all humans and all other species suffer equally. They don't. However, that doesn't contradict the fact that the site of the destructive processes labeled the Anthropocene is and remains the planet. In other words, the reality of the Anthropocene is a planetary one. The question I'm going to ask here today is, or could be phrased as, what do the other eye of history see? The one that is looking for time, not place, and that is guided by chronology, not geography, at least not primarily. When is the Anthropocene? The question will guide us through the lecture. Um, in the first part, I will discuss with you the act of periodization uh, performed by the concept of the Anthropocene, what it does, what it means, and how it impacts all the different times at work in history, in the already indicated multidisciplinary sense of history, the different lifetimes, to use a key word, from our ongoing research project. Then in the second part of the lecture, I'll discuss in some more detail the anthropocentric past or pasts by going through rather quickly, I'm afraid, some of the answers to the most hotly debated questions in the Anthropocene debate. When did it begin? And frame them in terms of some alternative theories of time. Finally, in the third part of the lecture, I'll turn to what I call the anthropocentric present, proposing to understand the temporality of the Anthropocene as an expanded, multiplied, as well as a highly politicized now. To shift from anthropocentric past to anthropocentric present will also involve a radical shift in temporal extension. 
duration, if you will, and speed from the millions and billions of years of Earth's history to the accelerating day-to-day -day rhythms of present-day politics. In all three parts of the lecture, I'll pursue a similar argument, which is presented in the subtitle, The Multiple Lifetimes of Climate Emergency. As such, the vivid and often ferocious debate of the when of the Anthropocene, especially the when of the beginning of the Anthropocene, is merely a symptom, I argue, of a much deeper and more pervasive confusion about the many often contrasting and conflicted times at stake of different duration, speed, and rhythm. What they have in common, however, is that they all have to do with life, different forms of life, the life of the planet, the life of various species, in some cases threatened by extinction, the life of indigenous peoples, past and present, but also our life in the current moment. They are indeed lifetimes, albeit very different scale, and as such raise moral and political issues pertaining to whether and how these lives are allowed to go on, survive and thrive. However, I'm going to start at the most simple, straightforward end with the question of periodization. And I presume that if this isn't working sound wise, or if I'm going too fast or something doesn't work, that someone will alert me to this. If not, I will just uh, keep going. So uh, periodization acts and impacts. Um, at the most basic level, the Anthropocene is a name for a period of time, a period of history a name that constitutes an intrinsic part of an act of periodization. As you know, periodization is one of the fundamental activities of historiography in all disciplines, just as fundamental as the identification and ordering of events into cause, effect, chains, and narratives. Practices of periodization are as ancient as historiography itself and involve identifying the beginnings and endings of historical processes, the limiting sets of historical events, and giving them a kind of coherence and a common denominator. In a second step resulting from a successful act of periodization, the period becomes a historical framework, a synchronic, more or less homogeneous context used for understanding or explaining events and lives. As all historians are aware of, well, at least when they take the time to think about it, periodization comes also with its own politics, mostly a politics of delimitation, rupture, and new beginnings. Periodization is often aimed to break free from a painful and haunting past, and at the same time, turn this past into a closed, clearly defined unit of time, which can be handled and manipulated at will. So the most paradigmatic examples of periodization count the Middle Ages, invented by Renaissance scholars in order to frame themselves as a new beginning, as the heralds of a new era, which also reconnected back to the golden age of antiquity. In order to achieve that, however, they had to bracket the thousand years that had passed in between, periodize them in order to excise them from history. In this way, they could break free from structures and systems in the wrong time that they were opposed to. Christianity, feudalism, superstition, and replace them with rationality, absolutism, and science. Another telling example is the Enlightenment as a periodization, an act of periodization directed at the 18th century. In a similar way as present-day geologists and earth system scientists, Enlightenment thinkers were involved in practices of self-periodization, identifying and defining the period that they were themselves part of. However, it wasn't until the early German romantics like the Slegel brothers wanted to boost their own careers by vehemently rejecting their predecessors that the Enlightenment solidified into a historical period associated with rationalism, formalism, and lack of feeling. Although period names should be understood in terms of speech acts performed to achieve goals that are specific to the context in question, they have proven hard to get rid of. They tend to linger. At present, medievalists still struggle to rid themselves of the prejudice that they have specialized in a period of stagnation, decline, and general darkness. In all these cases, periodization is a tool to achieve goals that are in themselves not epistemological or scientific, but also moral and political. For the Anthropocene, this is no different. On the contrary, whereas the Middle Ages and the Enlightenment refer themselves specifically to human time, or rather to that specific form of human time we call history, which mostly deal with the last 6,000 years, predominantly with the last 300 or 250, or even just the last 50. The Anthropocene addresses a wide range of times, of temporalities. 
However, just as the main temporal framework within which Middle Ages and the Enlightenment are supposed to make sense is historical time or just history, the main temporal framework for the Anthropocene is geology, or more precisely, the geologic timescale. On the 21st of May, 2019, following always, almost 20 years of intense debate between scientists of various kinds, the so-called Anthropocene Working Group, headed by the British geologist John Salisevich, voted to submit an official proposal to the International Commission of Stratigraphy to approve the Anthropocene as a geological epoch and add it to the geological timescale. The aim was, by means of chronological periodization, to account for the profound ways in which humans have altered the planet. Even though the time system itself is based on geology and adhered to, more precisely, uh, to geological, excuse me, more precisely, geochronological and chronostratigraphical practices of periodization, the phenomena that are listed as associated with the Anthropocene covers various domains of the Earth system and come with their own knowledge formations and their, indeed their own times. I quote from the, from the document presented at the vote. Phenomena associated with the Anthropocene include an order of magnitude increase in erosion and sediment transport associated with urbanization and agriculture, marked and abrupt anthropogenic perturbations of the cycles of elements such as carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and various metals together with the new chemical compounds, Environmental exchanges generated by these perturbations, including global warming, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and spreading oceanic dead zones. Rapid changes in the biosphere, both on land and in the sea, as a result of habitat loss, predation, explosion of domestic and animal populations and species invasions, and the proliferation and global dispersion of many new minerals and rocks, including concrete, fly ash, and plastics, and the myriad technofossils produced from these and other materials. Now, the first striking thing in our context is the amount of time words, if you like, word that describe different kinds of temporal movement, like in this quotation, like cycles, perturbations, changes and rapid change it, changes, but also temporal qualifiers like new, old or dead. And the declaration goes on moving from perturbations and change to duration, preservation and even permanence. I quote again, many of these changes will persist for millennia or longer and are altering the trajectory of the Earth system, some with permanent effect. They are being reflected in the distinctive body of geological strata now accumulating with potential to pre be preserved into the far future. But which far future? In the proposal from the uh, Anthropocenic Working Group, past, present and future proliferate depending on the lives and materials they emerge from and that embody them. Urbanization and agriculture are usually studied in the framework of human history, whereas the first significant increase in global urban population is dated to the first millennium BCE. The history of agriculture is traced back to the Neolithic Revolution, started around 12 or 11,000 years ago. By contrast, habitat loss, predation, explosion of domestic animal population, and species invasions are staples in the history of non-human life, rendered, rendered according to the timelines and narratives of evolutionary biology. Duration, speeds and rhythms, including for some plants, insects and animals, the imminent threat of extinction are relative to the species in question. In other words, even though the Anthropocene as presented by its dedicated working group is a unit, a period of geological time, it bundles in it multiple different times, both long and short, with various periodizations and intervals. In that sense, the Anthropocene can be said to work as a synchronizer, a concept that pulls multiple times and histories together into one temporal framework, which is the geologic timescale. Since we could call this diagram uh, the primary enabling technology, or the the primary media even of the Anthropocene, and since it has already become an iconic visualization for a lot of scientific and political concerns, we should give it some attention. A period of history, whether human or otherwise, is usually represented as a piece of a line, according to ID, the idea of time as linear and directional. A timeline 
or even a time's arrow. The geological time is slightly more complicated to the extent that the line has become a table with multiple columns and colors. Not that this is something new in the history of historiography. On the contrary, the geologic time scale is drawing on an old and venerable tradition of representing time as tables with several columns in order to illustrate different time reckoning practices. Like in the case of Christoph Helwig's Theatrum Historicum from 1609, or even more spectacular, Friedrich Karl Fulda's Karte der Weltgeschichte from 1782. In this sense, the timeline is rather the anomaly. Now, in our table or expanded line, if you like, the possibility for change for additions is found in the upper left corner. This is where we encounter the epoch of the Holocene, the one we find ourselves in currently, unless, or maybe rather until, the Anthropocene Working Group succeeds with their proposal to change it into the Anthropocene. Holo, as you know, comes from the Greek and means whole, where seen, also originally Greek, means new. In other words, the Holocene means something like the new or the recent whole. Of course, recent is here a relative term since the Holocene began some uh, 11,650 uh, 11, years ago, when the last glacial period ended. In the geologic system of time intervals, which is, as you can see, a rather complex one, the Holocene has a st status of an epoch. Hence, the Anthropocene would also be an epoch in geological terms. Based on that alone, we can imagine a geological time as a succession of epochs strung together to form a timeline. But clearly, it's more complicated than that. As you can see, there are also ages and periods. Together with its predecessor, the Pleistocene, the Holocene makes up the period of the Quaternary, which began 2.6 million years ago, when large masses of ice gathered around the poles. Furthermore, all this happens within the Cenozoic era, another term of geological periodization, which goes back 65 million years and is kicked off by the impact of a meteorite, probably the one that killed all the dinosaurs. And even that is small. Our table has left out the largest periodization of them all, the Eon, called the Phanerozoic, which began 542 million years ago with the emergence of active mobile multicelled life forms. Now, why is this important? Why do we need to know all this? Why do I tell you all this is probably the more pertinent question. Simply because the Anthropocene is by far the most effective neologism of our time. And we need to know both what it means and what kind of work it does in both science, technology, and politics. But also because as a periodization, and even before it has been officially approved, the Anthropocene has already gained a kind of self-evidence, as if we always already knew what it was. It's the period when humans started impacting the planet in irreversible ways. But just as words like impact can, can contain, indeed conceal, a multitude of sins, the Anthropocene can contain and indeed conceal a multitude of times. Urbanization, industrialization, globalization, species extinction, the oceans filling up with plastic, CO2 gathering in the atmosphere. When all these times, these processes and durations are assembled into one singular concept, we risk losing sight of the specificities and hence our ability to act upon them. Which brings me to the second part of the lecture in which I discuss the anthropocenic past, especially the question that seems to haunt scientists across fields and disciplines. When did the Anthropocene begin? Just going to check how I'm for time. Seems good. Mm. Now, um, in the first part of the lecture, I laid out what the Anthropocene is temporally speaking, a name for an epoch in Earth's history yet to be officially approved, but also a synchronizer, bringing different times into uh, one and the same conceptual framework. These times have various, often conflicting durations, speeds and rhythms, which are aligned and synchronized in the concept itself. The Anthropocene is both urbanization and extinction, both industrialization and ocean acidification, and so on. 
As the German historian Reinhard Koselek has argued, concepts, as in this case the Anthropocene, are not only assemblages, aggregates of meaning, but also contain temporal structures, interconnecting pasts, presents, and futures in specific ways. To take a well-known example, the modern concept of democracy mobilizes a past that stretches back to Greek antiquity, the so-called cradle of Western civilization, but it also points forward toward a utopian future when democracy has supplanted all form, other forms of government and has become um, a true rule for and by the people. Finally, in the present, the concept of democracy is applied to practices of government all over the world with varying degree of success and applicability. This raises the question, if we can find a similar structure in the concept of the Anthropocene, and in that case, what kind of past, presents, and futures are brought about by it, and with what social and political implications? The past is at the same time the most graspable and the most scientifically controversial of the anthropocenic time dimensions, especially the beginning, which for more than a decade has been hotly, uh, been a hotly contested topic among biologists, geologists, earth system sciences, and philosophers. The beginning is crucial because this is how geological periodization works. This is how, how geological epochs are defined based on their beginnings when something happens that separates the new from what went before. The question is announced already in the first publication about the Anthropocene when Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer launched the concept in 2000, in the year 2000, in a newsletter from the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, IGPBP. Crutzen and Sturmer admit that the start date is set somewhat arbitrarily, as they put it, they write. To assign a more specific date to, to the onset of the Anthropocene seems somewhat arbitrary, but we propose the latter part of the 18th century, although we're aware that alternative proposals can be made. Some may even want to include the entire Holocene. However, we choose this date because during the past two centuries, the global effects of human activities have become clearly noticeable. This is the period when data retrieved from glacial ice cores show the beginning of a growth in the atmospheric concentrations of several greenhouse gases, in particular CO2 and CH4. Such a starting date also coincides with James Watt's invention of the steam engine in 1784. In addition to ice cores and atmospheric concentrations of what they then still called greenhouse gases, uh, it's been been uh, obsolete, I think, that term afterwards. The beginning of the Anthropocene is even associated with an individual human life, almost as if it had been the Renaissance, only this is not Leonardo da Vinci, but James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine. Another striking synchrony is, of course, the beginning with, the, with one of the most effective periodizations in the historical disciplines in modern history, namely modernity. Last year, when the Anthropocene Working Group finally voted in favor of proposing to the International Commission of Stratigraphy to adopt the Anthropocene as, as they put it, a formal chronostratigraphical unit, they suggested another beginning. They ask, should the primary guide for the base of the Anthropocene be one of the stratigraphic signals around the mid 20th century of the common era? This put to the vote in the working group. Of course, this is a more complicated way of asking when did the Anthropocene begin? However, the complications are important since they point us toward some of the temporal conditions invo involved in attempting a changing or at least adding to the geologic timescale. But just again, to start at the simple end. Different from Crutzen and Sturmer, the Anthropocene Working Group does not date the beginning of the Anthropocene to the end of the 18th century, but to the mid 20th century. In a document preparing the vote, they give some explanation for this choice. They list four relevant points, defining what they mean by the Anthropocene. It's being considered as a series ep epoch level, and so its base beginning would terminate the Holocene series or epoch, as well as the Megalion stage H. It would be defined by the standard means for a unit of the geological timescale via a global boundary, boundary stratotype section and point, GSSP, colloquially known as a golden spike. Third, its beginning would be optimally placed in the mid 20th century, coinciding with an array of, geologi array of geological proxy signals preserved within recently accumulated strata and resulting from the great acceleration of population growth, industrialization, and globalization. 
for the sharpest and most globally synchronous of these signals that may form a primary marker is made by the artificial radionuclide spread worldwide by the thermonuclear bomb test from the early 1950s. Now, I'll come back to epoch stages and ages, spikes and markers in a second, for those of you less familiar with geological terminology, but I'll start with how this relates to human history, evoked in the term, the great acceleration naming the surge in the growth rate of human activity, population growth, cons consumption growth, production growth, etc., from around the end of the World War II. In another table, the so-called planetary dashboard developed by the uh, IGPB, the great acceleration is broken down into a set of 24 global indicators showing the influence human beings have had on the planet in recent decades. They all begin to to spike in the mid 20th century and continue till this day. For the Anthropocene Working Group, these count as signals, as they put it. But the most important signals, because to the most global is synchronous, are the one left by the nuclear bomb test from the 1950s, which spread in their artificial radionuclides all over the world. So far then, we have encountered two different beginnings of the Anthropocene launched by different researchers and research groups, both defined according to traditional principles of time reckoning in the West. In other words, both use time technologies that go back to the Julian calendar <coughs> introduced during the reign of Julius Caesar, then replaced by the Gregorian calendar one and a half millennia later and the Pope Gregory the 13th. Furthermore, these chronological principles rest on the work of Dionysius Exegus, who around the year 500 introduced the year zero, and hence a time that could stretch endlessly both into the past and into the future. But these are by far not the only dates that have been discussed leading up to the submission of the proposal. Many other beginnings of the Anthropocene have been suggested. I will uh, only mention a couple of them that I find especially illuminating. Now, in an article published in the journal Nature in 2015, entitled Defining the Anthropocene, two British geographers, Simon Lewis and Lee Maslin, argued, argued that the beginning of the Anthropocene should be dated to either 1610 or 1964. In the perspective of geological time, this is almost like indicating the exact time of day. But these are only, but in their article, these are only two of a long list of potential start dates for the Anthropocene epoch, which also include, as you can see, megafauna extinction, the origin of farming, and anthropogenic soils. For each of these alternatives, there's a primary stratigraphic marker and a potential GSSP date, where GSSP, as already noted, stands for Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point, often referred to as a golden spike. Now, if you look more closely at one of the two dates that Louis and Maslin ends up suggesting as a starting point for the Anthropocene in 1610, we see that the event in question is what they refer to as the New Old World Collision, taking place over a 300 year period, which is indeed much longer than we would normally consider as a historical event. The precise date, however, 1610, we find over on the other side of the, of the table of the diagram, um, uh, in the column for potential GSSP dates. What happens on this date, however, is not the discovery of another piece of terra incognita, incognita of the new world, but that the CO2 levels uh, in the atmosphere reaches the minimum, an all time low, if you like. However, this chemical, seemingly morally and emotionally indifferent marker has a historical origin, which points to one of the darkest chapters of human history. According to regional population estimates, a total of 54 million people lived in the Americas in 1492, the year Columbus arrived. The population was even growing rapidly. In 1650, there were only 6 million people left. The rest had succumbed to disease, war, enslavement, and famine at the hands of the Europeans. The accompanying near cessation of farming and reduction in fire use, Louis and Maslin adds, resulted in the regeneration of over 50 million hectares of forest, woody savanna and grassland. By consequence, global carbon emissions reached their lowest point in 2000 years. Finally, returning to the table, the primary stratigraphic marker for this low point in CO2 emissions can be found in glacier ice in the middle of the table. For many of these 
vertical connections, we could construct similar narratives. Lewis and Masson article sparked a vivid debate in the pages of Nature. The most vehement attack came from the Australian philosopher Clev Hamilton. The dip in CO2 emissions around which Lewis and Maslin weaved their narrative, he argues, was probably due to natural variability. Furthermore, he adds, they're so bent on finding a golden spike that they ignore what the Anthropocene is really about in the first place, human-induced climate change. No, I'm not going to spend any more time on these uh, slightly tiresome debate, maybe, at this point. Um, but I will conclude the second part of the lecture with one observation from the history of knowledge having to do with these two guys that would be familiar to you, uh, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Because I find it striking how the various forms of time operating in the geological time scale appears to be at odds with each other, at least in the discussion about the Anthropocene. On the one hand, there's the geochronological periodizations, lining up periods, ages, eons, and, and eras, each with their defined chronological start and end point on a long, complex, and multidimensional, but still a recognizable timeline. In a sense, then, geochronology, we could say, it works in and with Newtonian time, absolute, homogeneous, and independent of anything as external, as he puts it a separately existing system into which things of the world can be placed. On the other hand, there's the chronostratigraphical search for markers found in layers and sections consisting of rock, earth, or ice, which separates one stratotype section from another. This is a purely embodied and relational time, which comes into being with the things themselves. In this case, the layers of rock, earth, and ice. In a philosophical sense, the chronostratigraphical endeavor points to another tradition in the understanding of time, championed by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in his controversy with the Newton student Samuel Clark, then living on in the works of Herder, Bergstrom, and Deleuze, to only mention a few. In this sense, the GSSP dates or the golden spikes are attempts to align and synchronize empty chronological Newtonian time with embodied relational ontological time, Leibnizian time, if you will. That this is a challenging task should not come as a surprise. And I'm not in no way the one to offer a solution. So instead, I'll proceed to the third and, and final part of my talk, which moves from the Anthropocenic past to the Anthropocenic present, to the now, if you will. And uh, this is gonna be uh, hopefully a little, little more accessible and less, less uh, terminologically complicated than the first and second part, I hope. Now, even though they wildly disagree about the beginning of the Anthropocene, there's no disagreement between geologists, geographers, and earth system scientists that if something like a geological epoch called the Anthropocene really exists, we, everything that lives and breeds today, are in it. Or even scientists who are willing to accept less specific, even multiple beginnings of the Anthropocene, as long as everyone can accept that we are now in a period of human-induced climate change. As much as this sounds like a Solomonian solution, granting everyone uh, desperately needed respite from the struggles of geochronology and chronostratigraphy, it comes with a fatal flaw. The idea of an Anthropocene moving from an unknown past into an unknown, albeit catastrophic future, passing through the now, which we coincidentally inhabit. This Anthropocene completely ignores that the present, the now, what the critic Walter Benjamin famously called Jetzt-Zeit, now time, is radically different from the durations of the past and the anticipations of the future. Indeed, it's easy to forget that time has three dimensions. And even if they're related to each other on the timeline or in a more complex structure, each of them is a dimension in its own right. The now, the now, no less than the two others. Or to put it another way, even though all three dimensions, past, present, and future, are assemblages of different times, 
the geochronological and chronostratigraphical times of the Earth, the times of different species, as well as the times of historical events in human history, their hierarchy, hierarchy is different. If the past of the Anthropocene is dominated by science and scientists, the present is fundamentally political. The now is a time of political agency and actions, often in re response to sudden and critical events like extreme weather, pandemics, terror attacks, hunger catastrophes, or refugee crisis. At the end of their article, Lewis and Maslin acknowledges this tension, or they seem to do, um, as they move from the past into the present of the Anthropocene, and at the same time from the epistemological to the political. To date the beginning of the Anthropocene to 1610, they argue, implies that colonialism, global trade, and coal brought about this Anthropocene. Broadly, this highlights social concerns, particularly unequal power relationships between different groups of people, economic growth, the impact of globalized trade, and our current reliance on fossil fuels. The onward effects of the arrival of Europeans in the Americas also highlights a long-term and large-scale example of human actions unleashing processes that are difficult to predict or manage. Now, in this passage, the author shifts the impact of the concept of the Anthropocene from the scientific to the political realm. The question is no longer whether it's geochronologically or chronostratigraphically viable, but whether it's politically effective. In this way, the Anthropocene is shifted into political time, or maybe this is where it always belonged. Now, basically this talk, I think, has two arguments. One that the struggle to define the Anthropocene is fundamentally a struggle with aligning and synchronizing multiple, often co contrasting and conflicting lifetimes, biological, historical, geological, and multiple times also in a philosophical sense, Leibnizian or Newtonian. Two, that the Anthropocene, even though it translates into something like recent human, just that the Holocene was recent whole, actually, actually should be taken to mean now, to mean our present moment, our current time, a standpoint in history from where we can both look into the past and into the future, a time saddle we can sit on, as William James put it. The radical and extreme nowness of the concept of the Anthropocene is clearly visible in the origin story that's been circulating in every article trying to promote or debunk the concept, here in a version from Jane Carruthers from 2019. The concept of the Anthropocene has been buzzing around for nearly two decades. The first reference to the Anthropocene as a name for the current geological epoch arose, uh, arose in February 2000 during a meeting of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program in Cuernavaca, Mexico. On that occasion, Paul J. Crutchen, the Dutch Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist and the vice chair of IGPB, had become increasingly impatient with his colleagues, uh, uh, repeat the use of the word Holocene and exclaim, stop using the word Holocene. We're not in the Holocene anymore. We're in the, 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 the Anthropocene. To refer to oral communication in a scientific article is it's in itself a rare thing, simply because oral communication is a thing of the moment. Something is uttered, then it's gone. Scientific evidence, on the other hand, comes in the form of writing, which can be repeated, quoted, relied upon, criticized, transported from one site of research, in this case, Cuernavaca, Mexico, to another, like an immutable mobile, as Bruno Latour once called it. The radical nowness of Crutchen's exclamation is further emphasized by his stutter, which takes us back to the exact moment before he lets out the word that's going to change the order of knowledge forever. Then he lets it, lets it rip, the, the, the Anthropocene. Of course, as for almost every moment of radical invention, there's a prehistory of the pre or a predecessor. In this case, Eugene Sturmer, who originally coined the term in the 1980s in different contexts, and now went on to co-author with Kretz in the initial scientific publication on the topic. Nevertheless, the concept continues to echo with Kretz and Stutter as a permanent reminder of his desperate attempt to name, not a long past geological time, but his own present. Probably the Anthropocene would have been, more, uh, been a more useful concept if it always came with a stutter, a moment of hesitation. 
a moment of tearing. Geological concepts are about the past and they're defined by their beginnings. For obvious reasons, every other periodization, including in the geologic time chart, has happened post festum in most cases by millions of years. The only possible ex ex exception was the Holocene, the epoch we're still officially in until the International Com Commission uh, decides otherwise. And we officially wake up in the Anthropocene. Then again, the Holocene was always defined from its beginning uh, when the last glacial period ended some 11,650 years ago, whereas the Anthropocene as a response to an experience of the present, a present of accelerating climate change, species extinction, all population and all consumption, to find a beginning was paradoxically an afterthought. Until the International Commission of Stratigraphy agrees on the GSSP date, a golden spike, and maybe even after, the Anthropocene will continue to be a label for the present, the now alongside other similarly now-based, present-dist and equally gloomy concepts like crisis, emergency and disaster, only to mention a few. Until now, I've taken the claim that the Anthropocene is a periodization of geological time in addition to the geological time scale at face value. But what if it isn't? What if it just pretends to be? By adhering to the onomastic tradition, the naming practices of this particular chronological system the Greek word standing on scene. What if the most relevant rhetorical contextualization of the concept of the Anthropocene and its mobilization of different times is not the Holocene or the Pleistocene, but much more political words and statements, which aim to intervene in the present and change it more or less radically? What if the equivalent statement to we are in the, the, the Anthropocene rather is this? This is an emergency. For a while in 2019, this sentence figured on the front page of the website of Extinction Rebellion, which as most of you know, I'm sure, is a group established in the United Kingdom in May 2018 as a protest against the passivity and slowness of governments worldwide in dealing with climate change. Since its uh, inception, Extinction Rebellion has carried out various acts of civil disobedience. In April 2019, they occupied four prominent sites in central London. Since then, it has spread to other parts of the world. This is an emergency. We are in the, the, the Anthropocene. Both fra phrases name unexpected, singular, and unprecedented events. Linguistically, they're both declaratives, declarative sentences. They make statements, statements about how things are, about the real. Both have a deictic phrasing, starting with the deictic pronoun, pronouns, we, referring to some kind of abstract collective mankind or, or all possible life on earth, or possibly all life on earth, are in the Anthropocene. This is an emergency. This, the demonstrative deictic pronoun, has a distinct temporal meaning. This means now. Now is an emergency. We are in it. The declaration was picked up and repeated by governments and organizations across the globe. In the middle of the Brexit crisis, the British Parliament took the time to declare climate emergency. So did the Norwegian Green Party, so did the city of Oakland, so did the city of Konstanz, as well as many other cities. So what do these declarations do? What do they do to history, to the innumerable incidents that make up any historical moment and the trajectories that lead, lead into it? And what do they do to questions of agency? Who can act in an emergency? Who can act in the Anthropocene? As scholars in the humanities and social sciences, always keeping an eye out for surprising and unusual use of language, we should be well aware that when governments like the British Parliament start declaring things, the German words actually also often call out, we need to pay close attention. Especially since traditionally, the only other thing that political authorities declare are states of exception. Also not an irrelevant term after the corona pandemic hit us. And indeed, one way of understanding this particular speech act would be in light of the so-called totalitarianism of the climate movement, invalidating current laws and democratic principles. Rhetorically, Extinction Rebellion is navigating these waters. But another interpretation is also possible. Maybe sentences like, we are in the Anthropocene and this is an emergency shouldn't be understood as declaratives at all. 
They also perform another kind of speech act, which we should be well familiar with by now, the act of naming, of labeling. We already discussed the labeling practices associated with the Anthropocene in some detail. Even the emergency, however, is a label. What on, until now figured in government white papers, in political communication, in the press, as well as in social media as climate change, shall now be renamed climate emergency or climate crisis. Just like what until now figured on the geological label of the Holocene shall now be renamed the Anthropocene. In this way, an assemblage of facts about the increasing levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, rising global temperatures, species extinction, and extreme weather is giving another name, given another name, which differs from the old name mostly in the way it deals with time. Whereas change, respectively the Holocene, is ongoing, steady, regular, and predictable, crisis, or the Anthropocene, is sudden, emergent, decisive, dramatic, and potentially life and world changing. If the concept of the Anthropocene is comparable to concepts like emergency and crisis, steeped in the temporality of the now, it might be associated with some of the same risks. The shifts from concepts of development, reform, renewal, transformation, or simply change to crisis is not an innocent, innocuous, or self-explaining change of label. On the contrary, it carries a Janus face, brings with it, aggregates in it, conceptual meanings steeped in discourses and practices that are colonialist, imperialist, and globalist in the worst sense of the term, projecting Eurocentric ideas about humans and their environments onto the rest of the world. In addition, the fetishization of the decisive, possibly fatal now, risk closing off the future by cutting off every other road than the one leading straight into climate ap uh, apocalypse, as discussed by the Swedish intellectual historian Julia Murbla in an essay on the difference between Anthropocene and climate change temporalities appearing in critical inquiry in the spring. However, climate totalitarianism, and this is going to be my last point, uh, climate totalitarianism and crisis fetishization are not the only possible meanings of a concept of the Anthropocene absorbed in the now. What the historian Francois Artaud calls the monstrous present, unable to, meaning, to establish meaningful relations with the past and the future. However, the present is not just monstrous, cannibalizing the past and the future. It's also a site of political agency, indeed a necessary temporal framework for political action. In order to turn the Anthropocene into a concept that can help bring about meaningful moments of political agency, we need to change it, its relationship to the now. In other words, the form of its inherent presentism from evoking crisis to producing moments of intervention, involvement and change. To put it briefly, we need to transform the Anthropocene from a crisis concept to a Kairos concept. In ancient Greece, a key goal for socially and politically engaged thinkers like Protagoras and Gorgias, who we today know under the name the Sophists and who Plato taught us to despise, was to describe and give rhetorical shape to moments of contingency, unexpected moments in time when new possibilities, but also new dangers opened up. The term they developed for these moments was Kairos. Different from the slow, long-term temporality of Kronos, Kairos referred to a particular and exceptional moment, a rupture or a turning point, a favorable moment to speak or to act, a decisive, faithful, or dangerous situation. In Gorgias' own words, Kairos referred to a decisive moment that must be caught in passing. This moment is represented in art as a young man, shaved bald at the back, but with a long lock of hair at the front by which the swift or foresighted could catch them. The question we need to ask then is whether the concept of the Anthropocene can help us in recognizing the Kairos moment in time, just before it arrives, enable us to reach out and grasp it as, it was, as if it was the, lock, the long lock of hair at the front of the head of a young man. Thank you for your attention.